。好，那非常首先非常感谢大家在午餐后还可以继续回来参加我们这个会议。嗯，然后下面呢，我们继续下午的环节，就是第一部分是由 n e o 给大家带来的关于 OpenGL 还有 OpenCL 的这个部分的演讲，谢谢。Thank you, Angela. So we're going to start off this afternoon talking about the web standards,、um, bringing、um, the capabilities of OpenGL and OpenCL into HTML5.、Uh, HTML5 is Becoming increasingly important as a programming platform that lets people create applications that can run across multiple operating systems, multiple hardware,、uh, everything from cars to TVs to mobile devices to set-top boxes.、Uh, it's interesting that lots of the time the operating system vendors don't like to have tools that let applications move easily. From OS to OS,、um, but HTML5 could be、uh, the standard that they've all supported,、um, and so we have the chance to move content、uh, easily around from system to system. But traditionally, HTML was just for creating、uh, web content, laying out web pages with text, graphics,、uh, and some video.、Uh, if HTML5 is going to evolve beyond just being a Uh, HTML layout、uh, language into a full application platform. We need a lot more uh, uh, functionality,、um, the functionality that we used to have, used to having in native APIs such as multi-core、uh, CPU programming,、uh, rich 2D and 3D graphics, GPU compute, vision processing,、uh, multiple cameras,、uh, gesture processing. Uh, all of these things have to be brought into the browser. So, how can the browser community quickly create、uh, all this functionality? Well, one answer is not to reinvent that functionality from the ground, but to use all of the native APIs that we've been discussing this morning, and to lift them up into、uh, JavaScript, so to make them accessible. By the web community, so the first example we have is WebGL, which is a JavaScript binding into OpenGL ES.、Uh, we already have started a second project、uh, called WebCL, which is a JavaScript binding into OpenCL for parallel computing, and I'll show you some videos, some demos using WebGL and WebCL、uh, in a second. But I think you're going to see more and more cooperation between the W3C, that's the World Wide Web Consortium that controls many of the web standards, and organisations like Kronos that have been defining native APIs. There's more opportunities to bring these two worlds together. So, for example, Google has an audio standard called Web Audio. We're working with them now to make sure that we can accelerate Web Audio over Open Max. Uh, there are Canvas and SVG 2D vector graphic APIs already in HTML5. We can accelerate those over OpenVG and OpenGL ES. And then there might be some further cooperation in discussions, perhaps bringing more sophisticated camera and video processing into HTML5 with a JavaScript binding into OpenMax,、uh, a web VL for vision processing into A binding、uh, through JavaScript into OpenVL, and more advanced sensor fusion processing by、uh, using stream input. So I think this is going to be、uh, a lot of interesting developments over the next、uh, few years. But WebGL is here today.、Um, it's bringing 3D graphics into the internet. There's been a lot of history.、Uh, people have been trying. Uh, for over 15 years to bring 3D graphics into the web, and、uh, some of you might remember Vermal,、uh, some of the earlier initiatives. WebGL is the big move for 3D in the web because, for the first time, we don't need a plugin.、Uh, Flash and Vermal、uh, have always needed a plugin to bring extra functionality to the web. This time, the browser vendors are implementing. The WebGL functionality in the browser itself, and it's 
become the right time to do this because two things have happened at, uh, at the same time and come together. One is that the browsers are getting faster. JavaScript is getting faster and faster over time. And we have the HTML5 canvas tag, which is a surface where we can draw individual pixels for the first time. Before, we could only draw text. We could draw uh, uh, an uploaded image. But we couldn't control the individual pixels. Canvas is the thing that changes that. It means that we can have a, now an API that draws 3D uh, pixels uh, in the browser itself. The other thing that happened from the Kronos side is that OpenGL and OpenGL ES are now pervasively available. Anywhere that's capable of running a browser now is almost certain to have either OpenGL or OpenGL uh, ES. So the browser vendors feel safe to implement 3D in the browser and be able to run that browser uh, anywhere. So now with the JavaScript binding to OpenGL ES and the Canvas tag, we can declare a 3D context uh, for the canvas and start doing 3D graphics uh, in the browser. WebGL 1.0 is already released. Uh, it was released at GDC um, March last year. So it is just over a year old. And we have Mozilla, Apple, Google, and Opera uh, working closely with the GPU vendors. And pretty all of those vendors now, those browser vendors, have shipped um, uh, WebGL in their production uh, browsers. So how does the WebGL uh, implementation uh, look. Uh, everything is built on top of the drivers. So we have OpenGL or OpenGL ES or even now if a, if a system has DirectX rather than OpenGL there's an open source project called Angle which is from Google which creates a conformant OpenGL ES 2.0 over DirectX 9. So even if your system is not OpenGL capable uh, we can create OpenGL from DirectX. Then, on top, we have the browser vendors implementing these blue, blocks, uh, blue boxes. So they've always implemented HTML, uh, the HTML layout engine. They've implemented the CSS, cascading style sheets. They have the JavaScript interpreter. Now, the browser vendors have implemented the WebGL block, a 3D player built into the browser uh, itself. Then, you have the content. The content can call through JavaScript, any of those blue blocks. And they can call them directly, or it can go through a JavaScript middleware library. And it depends on how expert you are at 3D. If you're an expert 3D programmer, you will find WebGL very familiar. It's just like OpenGL ES2 that Tom was describing uh, earlier. And you can just start writing 3D. Uh, if you're a new uh, to 3D programmer, or you're a normal web programmer that hasn't done 3D before, you'll probably want to use some of the middleware libraries that simplify things and present a higher level uh, calling interface. So, the way that HTML5 content makes its way to the screen, uh, the traditional HTML5 content, like the text and the images, uh, typically is passed through the CSS layout engine and then placed directly uh, on the screen uh, for display. All of the new types of content, like the video tag, the canvas tag, which has a 2D vector graphics API, and the WebGL uh, are generated off screen. The JavaScript engine is the thing that gives you the interactivity. So if you're doing an interactive 3D app, uh, you will use the JavaScript to generate to a new frame every 30th of a second. The off-screen content is then composited, goes through the CSS layout engine, and then is put it on to the screen. And in the modern browsers, that composition step, taking the off-screen content and bringing it onto the screen, uh, is also accelerated by the GPU. So the exciting thing about uh, WebGL, it's uh, a not trapped in a rectangular window. In the old browser days where you had to have 3D in a plugin, the, the plugin uh, was restricted to a separate window. So you, your 3D was trapped into a rectangular window and it couldn't interact with the rest of the browser stack. 
Now that 3D is built into the browser itself, you can begin to underlay and overlay the 2D and 3D content uh, in very flexible ways. So you can use, for example, a frame from an HTML5 video as a texture in WebGL. Uh, you can use Canvas as a texture. So you can begin to use the 3D graphics, not just for content like games, but for new in user interfaces. In fact, Google and Mozilla have been working together to actually uh, render a complete page as a texture whilst it's continuing to be live. You can click on uh, the, the rendered page, but you can use it as a texture in WebGL. So you can have like a book of web pages that uh, are animated in 3D, uh, still while being live web pages. I think it's the beginning of creating some really interesting uh, user interfaces. So why don't I show a quick demo? Have a video, because I don't have internet here. But WebGL is already shipping in production software. The one that you might have used yourself is Google Maps. If you use the Chrome browser, you can turn on GL Maps by clicking the box in the bottom left corner of your browser, and all of the rendering then gets accelerated by WebGL. So this is the production uh, Chrome browser running Google Maps, and you can see if you're clicking close enough to places that have been modeled in 3D, this is the Colosseum in Rome, in Italy, you actually have a full 3D model and you can rotate around that model and look at it from various angles. You can get closer and eventually when you get close enough it will take you into a street view seamlessly. This is all being rendered in WebGL and you can look around in a very you know, interactive way. And you can move around inside this 3D model. You click on a, on a destination over there all that warping and transformation from one place to the next, that's all being processed in, in WebGL. So your browser has become a highly interactive 3D application uh, in its own right, of course, connected to the internet. And uh, this is just the first example of applications that people, millions of people are using every day. Um, is being now accelerated by uh, the WebGL standard. So, how is WebGL uh, in its deployment? We mentioned that the WebGL 1.0 was released uh, in March last year, just over a year ago. Kronos has also created the typed array specification, which is a way of transferring bulk data um, from um, uh, between threads within the browser. That's now being used in many places in the uh, HTML stack. Um, and we're close to releasing 1.0.1, which is a maintenance release, fixes some bugs in the conformance uh, suite, so uh, we can get fully conformant, fully secure WebGL. That should be out in the next couple of months. But WebGL is all already being deployed, so this is my favorite website for tracking browser functionality. It's called caniuse.com. You go there and it's live updates. You can tell which browser is shipping which functionality. So the green boxes there show you that Firefox, Chrome, Safari and Opera are all now shipping uh, production uh, WebGL. The one that's missing is Internet Explorer. So we hope that Microsoft will adopt WebGL soon. We think there'll be enough content out there um, that uh, Microsoft will want to adopt. And over the next 12 months, you're going to see WebGL beginning to appear in mobile browsers. Uh, in fact, this is a couple of weeks out of date. Uh, Opera at MWC uh, just launched WebGL in Opera mobile. So now it's now, that's now shipping in their production uh, browser as well. But I think by the end of this next 12 months, uh, every mobile browser um, will hopefully have WebGL. And that, that update is really fast. I mean, uh, for OpenGL, yes, to get this widely adopted took about five years. And um, this WebGL has taken just one year. It's about five times faster adoption ramp than even OpenGL, yes. So uh, it's sometimes um, 
difficult to remember that WebGL is just one year old. So frameworks and tools, uh, increasing number of uh, JavaScript frameworks being uh, created and made freely available. Uh, this is a snapshot. Uh, I know you can't read that very well, but if you go to the link, uh, chronos.org, go to the WebGL tab, look at the wiki page, uh, that's community updated. So every time I go there, there's two or three more JavaScript uh, frameworks and lots of uh, very powerful frameworks for different types of applications. So you don't need to be an expert programmer. You can use one of these free uh, frameworks and get up and running very quickly. So there's a lot of, uh, been a lot of discussion about uh, WebGL security. Um, some people have raised the concern that WebGL is not secure. That's not true. WebGL is 100% secure, um, but there's the possibility of new bugs. Every time the browser has new functionality, there's a possibility that bugs in previously hidden code uh, is going to create uh, exploitation uh, opportunities. So the, the, this case, the software we're exposing for the first time are the GPU drivers. So the GPU drivers have not been exposed to the web before. So the GPU vendors you know, are working hard to make sure that their driver stack you know, is hardened. But this is going to be the case not just for WebGL, as all parts of the browser begin to use the GPU more and more, be it Canvas or you know, Adobe Stage 3D or even Silverlight or um, HTML layout itself. If, if they use GPU acceleration, the same GPU drivers are being exposed. So WebGL is kind of pushing out in the forefront, uh, making sure that the GPU drivers are, are hardened. In the short term, the browser vendors are going to maintain a white and black list. So if there is a security concern, um, the browser can be uh, blacklisted for a certain CPU driver. But over the longer term, I think you'll see WebGL is a great initiative and a great um, incentive for the GPU vendors to make sure their drivers uh, are uh, web hardened. And there's been a lot of um, confusion in the press about security, the, um, some paranoia um, that people could write shaders that would erase people's disk drives. Of course, for those of you who have done graphics programming, you'll know that the shaders are just restricted to the GPU. So a lot of this press is um, not very well informed. There was one attack um, that we found, which was you could write a shader program that would loop a, a, an amount of time depending on the color of the pixel. So you could create a very rough reconstruction of uh, an image in memory, uh, which was a potential um, uh, attack vector. But now, Again, Kronos has taken the lead to solve that. We have the cross-domain um, uh, requests. So you're not allowed to request an image across into another person's domain unless you have explicit permission. And again, that uh, mechanism now has been uh, adopted uh, throughout uh, the browser stack. So bottom line is WebGL is 100% secure. WebGL is also beginning to um, uh, catalyze some other um, related activities. Um, declarative 3D, if those of you um, participating in the W3C, uh, is a new initiative to uh, bring the 3D scene graph into the DOM database itself. And this is an interesting initiative because it's even more closely integrated uh, into the web and familiar with uh, standard web uh, developers. And uh, it's a community group by now, which means it's not yet a standard initiative, but I think it's getting closer to actually being a formal initiative. And it's interesting, you can make the analogy, SVG is a 2D API, but it's a scene graph API. Canvas is a lower level uh, immediate mode API. Um, WebGL is a media mode, just like OpenGL ES, and X3DOM, which is the tentative name for this declarative 3D API, 
is a scene graph API just like SVG and you know, the scene graph itself will be maintained in the DOM. So I think this is very complementary to WebGL. The, uh, the way this is implemented typically is you would accelerate XDOM over uh, WebGL. So it's interesting to see how this is going to develop over the next uh, couple of years. But we have another Kronos initiative called WebCL, um, C for Compute. It's a JavaScript binding into OpenCL. This was announced back in March. Uh, we already uh, quite a long way in defining this API. Um, the working group is definitely um, targeting to release a spec uh, this year. Um, many use cases for compute in the browser, uh, accelerating physics engines for gaming, accelerating image processing. You can have like a Photoshop like video editor, image editor, running at GPU rates uh, directly in your browser. And just like WebGL, WebCL has decided to stay close to the OpenCL standard. It gives you a lot of flexibility. It's lower level than many web standards, but the web community want these low level foundation APIs so they can build lots of flexible middleware on top, just like we're finding is happening with uh, web, WebGL. So let me show you one more video. This is a demo of a WebCL prototype from Samsung in California. This is running on a Mac, and this is a um, prototype running in the Safari uh, browser. So this starts out with a standard WebGL um, app, which is a simple 3D environment with two spheres. So this is running in a browser. Um, it's not a native app. It's, it's running very interactively, and you can see there's two, two spheres in an environment. Now we turn on a lot of compute. We're doing dynamic deformation on these spheres to make them jelly. And there's a lot of computation going into that. And you can see the JavaScript now is being overloaded. And we're, we've dropped down to uh, uh, two frames a second less. So if you use WebCL, take that computation and take it away from the JavaScript engine and put it back on the GPU. The GPU is, of course, much faster than uh, the CPU of JavaScript. So the computation goes way up, and we're back over 100 frames uh, a second. So you can see now we're using WebCL and WebGL together uh, to go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Um, and again, this is a simple demo, but you can imagine a game with a physics engine using WebCL to accelerate the physics and WebGL for the rendering to create games that will be as fast as native games just running as a web page. It's going to kind of change the world. And so the, um, it's interesting, so we have these uh, little ecosystem of visual computing APIs. We have OpenCL and OpenGL on the desktop. We have OpenGL ES for embedded systems. We have WebGL for 3D in the browser. And now it's joined by WebCL for compute in the browser. So our ecosystem of graphics and computing APIs uh, is complete. As I was saying, I think this is, is going to be significant. The HTML5 is going to change the world. I mean, people like mobile apps on your mobile phone, you know, using a map, a, an app rather than a browser, is kind of attractive. It's fast. It can be nicely designed. It's pretty. It's beautiful. Um, but with HTML5, with these accelerated apps, uh, APIs, particularly WebGL, that lets the app get directly to the GPU, you can have web pages that are just as beautiful and interactive as the fastest uh, native app. And for the developers, developing HTML web apps as opposed to native apps has many advantages. It's portable to any, any system. You can use exactly the same code as a web page or a packaged app. Um, your app is just searchable as a web page. You do a Google search and it's discoverable. You don't need to go through an app store anymore. And you can, uh, if you charge your users, you don't need to pay an app store tax. It's going to change uh, the mobile industry again very quickly. And you can see there's a lot of ecosystem building up around this opportunity. Um, there's some programming frameworks like PhoneGap and Sencha, which are uh, JavaScript-based um, frameworks 
for packaging um, applications, HTML5 code app is a standalone app, and for executing uh, operating system code before it becomes part of the standard HTML5. There are OS independent app stores, OS independent uh, payment systems, uh, language and JavaScript tools, uh, and Scriptum and Mandrill are interesting. If you have a native app today, um, and one example is an Epic brought the Unreal Engine over into uh, JavaScript, uh, there's a million lines of code. You don't want to rewrite a million lines of code. So they use them Scriptum, to, which is a C to JavaScript compiler, and you can just take a million lines of C code convert it into JavaScript, call WebGL, suddenly your app is runnable as a web page rather than a native application. And those tools are already working pretty well. And of course, altering tools, people used to use Flash for this kind of thing, and they still do. But even Adobe has now said the future is HTML5, and Adobe is in investing heavily in HTML5 tools to complement their Flash tools. So. You this whole HTML5 universe, it takes the browser vendors to implement WebGL, it takes the OS vendors to ship an HTML5 capable browser, which is happening, it takes the tools and frameworks vendors to put energy into HTML5, that's happening too. And then last but not least, of course, it takes the silicon vendors to create the APIs like WebGL that gives access to the hardware and to implement and ship those APIs. That's happening too. So all parts of the industry are getting the pieces together. I think WebGL, WebCL, uh, as part of this larger picture, is going to be significant over the next uh, few years. So that's the end. Uh, so the summary, HTML5 is kind of at the center of a growing ecosystem of cross-platform programming tools. And there's a lot of cooperation between the native APIs and the HTML5 JavaScript APIs. And you know, Kronos so is doing our part in the larger picture, driving the standards for hardware acceleration in HTML5. So um, if you're, this is interesting you know, to you, know, we're very interested in your, your feedback. Great, thank you very much. Um, my name is Wanyam Lee. So I'll talk about some uh, uh, introduction and overview of uh, OpenVG. And I will also talk about some kind of applications of OpenVG. Okay. Uh, this is the, the stack of uh, the Kronos API standard. The OpenVG is 2D vector graphics standard. So it Commonly, the OpenVG also use EGL layer to add as a hardware abstraction, abstraction layer. And then uh, uh, the syntax is very similar to, to, to OpenGL and OpenGL ES. So if uh, the programmer is familiar with OpenGL, then easily the, pro the, the programmer can easily learn the OpenVG API too. Okay, OpenVG is also read pretty open standard and low level 2D vector graphics. Low level means that it, it is similar, it is it's on, the, on the top of a silicon layer. So we assume that OpenVG will be implemented with hardware. So there are so many complex and so many, the, the, so many computation oriented the APIs is in OpenVG API. So the main target of a OpenVG application is SVG, SVG Tiny and SVG Basic Player and Flashlight Player and PDF View and PostScript Render and some kind of a Java standard like JSR 287, 271, 226, etc. And then it will be implemented it will be useful for implementing the portable contents and web application. Um, you can see that the demo of uh, some ebook in the demo desk. Okay, the, it is an ideal open bridge rendering pipeline architecture. So each drawing object should be passed should be passed this eight stage of pipeline, and then so actually 
is very similar to OpenGL.ES. Actually, the OpenVGL renderer is a big state machine. We can we define the input data and then we define them some kind of kind of a parameter of a drawing um, drawing option. Then we to, uh, we give command to draw path or draw image or draw font. Then the result image will be generated by render. So, uh, so the, the open feature is the how, how the feature is defined by how many features we can we can define in this state machine. So number one is path. We can we can define path shape with a, a straight line, bezier curve, quad, quadratic bezier and cubic bezier is possible, and elliptical arc and and we can connect it with with the, uh, with the complex shape of polygon is possible. Okay. And we can define the shape of stroking. So we can define end cap shape or join shape. And then we also define we we, we can also define the the dash pattern. And we can do the transform about the path and images. So in case of image, we can do the perspective transform, but for path or point, we, we, can, we, we can just do the affine transform only. And we also do the, the transform about the painting, so we can control and this kind of the painting also moving with the path, or we can independently transform uh, the, the painting independent to the path or image. Okay. So it is possible to we can control the five kind of a transform. Okay. Paint to fill paint, paint to 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 stroke and the the transform about the path from path to screen and image to screen and font to font to screen. So we can control five kind of a transformation, and then we we change the the, the vector data into bitmap data. It, its name is rasterization. Uh, in OpenVGL, rasterization means that the calculation of a coverage of a, each pixel. So we can so we, it means that we calculate alpha value of each pixel. Then it goes to anti-aliasing stage. Uh, OpenVGL also provide uh, the scissoring features and uh, the masking features. We can control the which pixel is drawn or which pixel is not drawn, and we can the we can operate uh, the mask by the add or subtract or union intersect, and then the we we should uh, the the paint that object or image with solid color or linear gradient and radial gradient and pattern. Okay. We can control the pattern repeat type, so the repeat or reflect repeat is possible and pattern also can be possible to, to, to pad or reflect or repeat is possible. In case of image drawing, there is a three kind of uh, image drawing model, the normal drawing and multiply drawing, and stencil drawing is possible. So. Normal drawing, the, we, we, we so normally normally the draw the, the source pixel, uh, the, the input input image into screen, and we can do with multiply, and we can do also doing stencil. Stencil is some kind of passing passing the, the pixel color value, then it will be blended into with by the the, the blending the selection, then we can blend with the background image. Even though the open VG means that back to graphics, there is the image, some uh, bitmap graphics feature also included in open VG APIs. So for example, in we can control the child image and we can do image filter function and image convolution function. In the last stage of pipe, open VG pipeline is blending the, the drawn result onto the previous image, previous screen the rendering result. So uh, there were there are ten kind of a blending functions. So, there is portal of functions and the additionally the darken, lighten, 
edit table and screen multiply blending is in OpenVGA API. So this is a list of a list of result image of each blending function. Uh, uh, bl the, the blending function is just a ten kind, but uh, in case of image drawing, there is a three kind of image drawing. So multiply and stencil is in image drawing. So totally thirty kind of uh, so image blending is possible. Okay. And the, another the feature of which is color transform. You can control the color, so we can make the inverse color, and we can make it more lighten or darken image by. At the, at, at, at the final stage of rendering, we can control the color. Font. Uh, in OpenVG 1.1, there is a, the font drawing function, but there is no, the, uh, it is not possible to draw, um, there is no API like uh, uh, draw this kind of string, is not exist in OpenVG API. The, the, the font drawing system in OpenVG 1.1 is for developing font system. So, uh, we, you, you, if you have planned to developing kind of font system, then you can use this glip, uh, glip rendering function. But, but uh, normally, the, this, this function is not used for normal the, the, some users. Uh, many companies, uh, many the OpenVG partners have uh, the OpenVG supporting font system, so you can license that kind of product. Or you can develop or, or your own uh, font system too. I, I will uh, uh, introduce some kind of how to implement OpenVG renderers. So, the number one way is the developing the OpenVG native graphics hardware. So you can see that Takumi's hardware is 100% OpenVG hardware renderer. Second way is that we can implement the, the read the software. So the problem is the software renderer is very slow. It depends on the CPU performance. And third way is we can use the OpenGL ES hardware or OpenGL hardware to render OpenVG. And we can also use the, some kind of a multimedia hardware like a bit bleed, high speed bit bleed, the bitmap graphics engine to to accelerating OpenVG, because even though very the vector internship drawing, the uh, in test with some software, then we conclude that eighty percent of uh, vector rendering is the bitmap processing. So if we have a very high speed bitmap processor, then we can process a vector drawing in CPU. Then we can tap, send it into high speed bitmap processor then we can achieve totally big performance of OpenVG rendering. This grip shows that some other standards and some technologies related to OpenVG. Uh, JSR 226 is uh, SVG time, oh, it, it should be, yeah, right. 226 SVG tiny 1.1 version and 287 is SVG tiny 1.2 version. 271 is very important standard. There's a MIDP, MIDP3, new version of it. The MIDP has the immediate graphing mode. It is designed with, based on OpenVG. So if we have OpenVG hardware, then easily we can implement as uh, JSR271. And the, this is MPEG part 20, it's a rich media standard. It is the mixture of MPEG plus SVG Tiny. And OMA is they define some mobile services. The DCD is some kind of a content push service, multimedia message. And then WAP browser is depend on the SVG. And HTML5 canvas use canvas 2D graphics use two kind of uh, 2D graphics. The one is SVG Tiny and second one is Canvas 2D, all SVG and uh, Canvas 2D is very intuitively easy to implement on using OpenVG. So, depend on and uh, many WebKit source code use GTK Plus or Cairo Graphics library. The Cairo Graphics can be accelerated on OpenVG. So, some part of a WebKit source can be accelerated on OpenVG. 
And Black, BlackBerry used only Java interface, but BlackBerry JDE has OpenVG interface. Nokia QT can be accelerated on, on OpenVG. Flashlight Player can be accelerated on OpenVG. But the problem is Google's gear use OpenGL currently. So. And the next version of a flashlight player also use use the, the use OpenGL yes to accelerating their contents. Yeah. There are so many applications. The most widely used application is GUIs. For example, Samsung Electronics, all feature phone use the OpenVG to draw their, their GUI. And Nokia also use uh, uh, OpenVG to draw their GUI. And we can you can see that the demo the, we can accelerate web browsers and ebook viewer and rich media viewer can be accelerated on OpenVG. And sometimes it can be used for monitoring and mapping application, use OpenVG too. Okay, so now the, the we OpenVG working group it, group uh, finished that standardization of OpenVG 1.1 and then now we are making some light version of OpenVG, so we call it OpenVG Light Profile. Uh, we will make some. We 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 hope to uh, the more the broaden uh, OpenVG usage. So uh, the, we will reduce very complex the feature of OpenVG, and then we will uh, reduce some kind of requirement for pixel format or and support supported the screen format and then so and then the open widget can, open widget light profile can be easily implementable on various kind of uh, hardware and and also software so and and my company Huon will some part of a code as a source code and then we will provide the, the open widget study kit in in kite program, kite program will be presented in later. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's my talk. Thank you.